Well, it's so good to be with all of you today. Happy to have another day to worship together and to be able to uh, study God's Word together, be able to offer up our praise to God. In uh, the lesson of the hour, I'd like to uh, present a lesson dealing with some of our basic duty as disciples of Christ. I think we had a Bible class oh, about a year ago where we studied about discipleship. And discipleship, of course, is about being a learner and a imitator of uh, our master, and he was a servant of God, and a major part of our life as Christians, if you wanted to sum it up, it's a life of service, a life of service to God and to other Christians and to those that live in the world round about us, uh, service of the gospel and trying to promote that cause in the world. So we live as uh, Christians a life of service. In this lesson, we're looking at uh, a number of verses that have the word service or serve in them. And, you know, the best way to let, I guess, the Bible talk to you, I believe in uh, the deductive uh, method of Bible study, where you induce uh, all of the information that the Bible gives on a subject, and then you draw away your conclusion and the general principles that are found there whereby you should live your life. And then you're following uh, not what you think so or tradition, but really what the Word of God has to say. So we want to look at these different Greek words uh, that are translated serve. The first there is the word like we get the uh, word deacon from. It means to await tables, to minister to, to serve a cause, to support it, serve as a deacon. Uh, the next word is the word that you talk about, uh, the service of a slave. And that word is used many times to talk about the way we serve our Lord. We don't do our will, but our master's will. And it means to serve, to be a slave, to be the servant of a king, a servant of God. And the third word is the more religious term to talk about the service of a priest. And it's also translated serve in our English Bibles to serve God, to serve at one's own expense. It's a voluntary uh, service, a generous service that you give, a priestly service and worship. So these words, you know, I'm not going to distinguish in every verse which one of the words is used, but you can see there are synonyms to talk about our service to God. And we want to, on the last day to have the Lord say to each one of us, blessed are you good and faithful slave? Enter into the joy of your master. That's what I want to hear. I want the Lord to say that to all of you on that last day, that we lived a life to serve the Lord. And Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, we have the example of our master. No disciple is greater than his master. He just tries to be like his master in the best he can. And uh, our master, Jesus Christ, was perfect. And he was perfect as a servant of God. He is a model that we can all look up to. And here's the way Jesus lived his life. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus wasn't in it for getting service from other people. He was in it to do God's will and to provide a service for us that nobody else could provide. And that was to lay down his life for us. Nobody could do that job but Jesus, and he came and did it perfectly well. When you look at his life, he did serve uh, as a model for every deacon and every servant of God that he came to serve, and the word used there, and he humbly gave up himself for other people. It was a loving service that he gave, sacrificial service. He served the poorest and the lowliest of men, people like me and people like you. He was willing to serve and lay down his life for. He gave up time and convenience and everything for the sake of the sick and the poor, especially those that are poor in spirit and poor in their soul. He took no rewards for the things that he did. He served uh, first and then left the glorification to God later on. And that's what we're doing. We serve the Lord and we try to help other people the best we can and we look not to get the reward right now, but we are happy to get the reward in the end because we know the Lord will do what's right. He showed a great, uh, this greatness of, uh, of all servants. He was the great model, and 
uh, a service that went so far as to suffer for us and to be willing to sacrifice his own uh, life for us. And the same kind of service his disciples are supposed to reflect. The example of greatness is there. You know, the Lord didn't say, do as I say, not as I do. He said, do as I say and I do. And that's exactly what we need to look to. Serve like the Lord. Forego these temporary earthly honors and let's try to get those heavenly, eternal rewards in the end. Uh, serve God. That is the focus first and foremost is that we need to all as disciples of the Lord, we need to remember our services for God. He is the one above all that we're doing whatever we do for is for his honor and glory. The true God and not idols is what we've all turned to when we were converted to Christ. The Thessalonians grew up in, in uh, idolatry, but when they heard the gospel and understood its duties, they turned to serve God. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We serve God now with a clean conscience. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That in all the things we do, we know that our conscience has been cleansed. All the things we had to feel guilty about in the past have been washed away. And now we can serve with a clean conscience. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So... We get our life right with God, and then we can serve. And we can serve Him from uh, a sense of uh, being right with God. We serve Him uh, with both our body and our soul. You really can't serve God right with just one without the other. You've got to have your heart in it, and you can't just uh, have a good attitude about things. You actually have to use your body in God's service. You need to be doing things for God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So in serving the Lord, from our hearts, we give our bodies over to do what God's will says we should do in all the areas of our life, toward our job and our families and towards our brethren and towards those of the world. Uh, we determine we're going to use our body to honor God. And we do it from our spirit. We don't get entangled in the things of the world to the point that we can't do our duty for God in service. And uh, he, Paul uses a soldier that gets uh, signed up in a Roman legion. And someone uh, assigns him that job. He can't get so entangled with earthly matters that he can't serve his general. And uh, same with all of us. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So certainly we have to think about, you know, our earthly obligations and make sure that we don't make such commitments to things of the world that we have to put the Lord second in our service. And as long as... As we serve the Lord, we need to do so uh, putting Him first as the motive for all that we do. Now, we are serving the Lord, fearing God, and we don't do the good things we do just to butter up people or to try to have an influence uh, and gain advantage over people by our behavior and conduct. But in everything we do, we're wanting the Lord to be glorified and, and people to think more highly of the God we serve. And we do the right thing, not to please men, but to please him. And he's talking to servants. Can you imagine being a slave in the first century? Why do you do a good job every day when somebody else owns you and you don't get any you know, physical reward out of it? Well, you try to bring glory to your Lord in heaven, even though you're a slave. With good will rendering service as to the Lord and not to men. In Colossians, a parallel verse says, in chapter 3 and verse 22, Slaves in all things obey those who are your master on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. It's with reverence and respect for God you try to do your job each day. And it doesn't matter what kind of men you're serving. 
uh, as a slave. You, you do your service the best you can. We serve the gospel is a major area, being a Christian, that we want to build up the gospel message and promote it in this world and spread it to other people so that they might grow and be saved. Uh, the Lord put us into service, and that was a great thing. You know, it's wonderful that the Lord uh, allows us to serve Him. What a, what a great job to serve the King. It says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12, Paul's talking about his apostleship. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Uh, Paul thought, what a privilege that he made uh, me an apostle and a preacher and a servant. Wow, what a great, great thing that he would count me worthy. And all of us ought to look at ourselves that way. What a privilege it is to be able to be a Christian and to promote the gospel cause. Uh, there is a wide door for service that's often open for us in this world. The fields are ripe for harvest all around us. There's in people in need of the gospel message. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, Paul talked about his... Uh, efforts to get to Corinth, and uh, yet he, he had to uh, uh, deal with other obligations. For a wide door of effective service has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. There's lots of opportunities to serve, and we have lots of opportunities. We just need to look for them and recognize them. There's proof of uh, your worth in the way that you serve. You know, uh, we're told about uh, Timothy, and what a great servant of Paul that he was and a servant of the gospel in the church. In Philippians 2.22, but you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serves his father. Uh, we are all to walk worthy if we want to be in the kingdom of God. One way is to serve the gospel. Do all you can to support it with contributions. <laughs> Encourage those that are preaching. Try to do what you can to spread the word yourself. All of those things uh, are worthy, and uh, they show your worth. In supporting the preaching of the gospel, Paul talked about churches that helped him so that he might be able to serve others. You know, whether you're actually doing the preaching or the teaching by your contributions, you're able to support the preaching of the gospel. So that gives you a share, and that's a part of our service. I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to serve you. The Church of Philippi and Thessalonica and other places in Macedonia sent to Paul so he could preach the gospel. And those churches got that credit for that service because they were supporting one that was serving. Serving fellow Christians is what the New Testament tells us that we need to make a priority of. We're all uh, meeting here today to hear sermons to engage in Bible classes in order that we might build up our souls and educate ourselves so that we might be better equipped to serve other Christians. That's what we're here for. It's not just a, you know, a, a ritual we're going through. It's an equipping, an educating that's going on, an edification. Listen to Ephesians 4.12, that all of the gifts of the apostles and prophets, uh, pastors and teachers, all of that is for the building up of everybody so we can all serve. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And of course, that's the way to build the church. It's not to have one person that does the work, but when everybody's equipped to do the work, then the church, the body of Christ, will grow. And in Romans chapter 12 and verses 6 through 8, uh, we're given a measuring stick on how much we should serve the Lord. Well, serve him with the amount that the Lord has given to you. <laughs> that's a way to serve him. And that's a pretty high measuring stick, isn't it? Uh, when you think about all the grace, all of the faith that's been produced in you, you know, use that to serve. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So put your heart into these things. We've each received by God's grace different talents, different uh, 
temperaments and abilities that we have to serve in different ways. Let's do so with all of our heart. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, and each one has received a special gift employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we got all kinds of great talents that might be able in the secular world to enrich ourselves, but we want to use our gifts and talents to look out for one another in the church and try to help each other and do so through love to have a higher motive for the things that you do in serving others and visiting somebody, trying to encourage them. Let it all be because you love them and you love the Lord. In Galatians 5 and verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So let it love be that motivation, not just a sense of duty, but affection and care for others. Helping needy brethren is a major part of the Christian service for other people. All of us are going to fall into need at different times. Might be right at the end of our life or uh, where it might be, but we need to think about the needs of others and serve them. That was a big part of proving their love for God and for the gospel was that they cared for brethren. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 12 in this section, he's talking about the uh, help for the poor saints of Jerusalem that had gone through so much persecution. That's where the gospel started. But they were persecuted. Their property was taken away from them. They had sacrificed their property to keep the church going in the beginning. And so now they'd fallen into need. And Paul was raising a contribution around the Gentile churches in order to take it to Jerusalem and help those brethren. It says, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God says this is going to not only help their physical needs, but all of those people are going to praise God, and God's going to get the glory when this is over. That kind of service. Needy saints need to be served and ministered to. And we have needy saints in this church, people that are suffering and sick and bedfast, and they need help. In Romans 15 and verses 25 through 27, But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Well, they helped you hear the gospel, and, and uh, there wouldn't be any Gentile churches if there hadn't been a church in Jerusalem that started it all. So certainly they ought to try to help them and do what they can. The spirit of our service. How do, we, how do we serve the Lord? What's the proper attitude? The Lord is pleased when we worship in spirit and truth. Same is true with any form of service that we give. Our heart has to be right. Well, listen to Hebrews 12 and verse 28. When we serve the Lord, we have reverence and awe for God. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. That doesn't sound like just going through the motions, does it, when you come to worship or whatever you do in service to God? You put your heart in it and you show awe and respect for God when you offer up your singing or you offer up your prayers or you hear His Word. Uh, whoops. Too fast. With faith, according to what the Bible says. You don't just offer it up to God with affection in your heart, but if you're really going to serve God properly, it has to be according to His way, what He has revealed about what He wants to be done. We have many in the religious world, they, they serve God in many different ways, but we are to serve by the way that's been revealed. And there's one way to do it, right, and that's the way the New Testament has set it forth, and we need to learn it and do it. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, But this I admit to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets. So the apostle Paul, he served God in the right way that Jesus had revealed. 
And it was in harmony with everything the Old Testament prophesied is the way the church and Christians serve. And we're not a sect. We try to be the church that's in the Bible and serve the way, not just a faith, but the faith. And with the Spirit and in the gospel, listen to Paul when he wrote to the Romans about his attitude of service. It says, For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. He said, I'm, I'm not insincere. I'm no hypocrite. I serve in my spirit. And God witnesses what's in my heart. That I preach the gospel the way God wants it to be preached. And the way we should serve in everything we do. In newness of spirit, there ought to be a new type of service that Christians offer to God. In Romans 7, 6, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Before they served as a part of the old covenant, Paul says. They, they had all these external commandments they were taught growing up, and they had, uh, you know, it really they fell short in all of that, and they were <laughs> actually guilty under that old law. But we got a new system. We've got the gospel system. By the grace of God, we've been set free from our sins, and now we serve not by the outward letter of the law so much as we've written that in our hearts, what God wants us to do, and we're serving from our hearts. We're trying to do the Lord's will. We have a renewed spirit in the way that we serve God. It's not grudging, but it comes from being set free and being uh, liberated that we're able to serve. A spirit of our service is seen again that we serve with the clean conscience. Before we were talking about how our conscience has been cleansed in the past. This verse talks about always doing what you think is right. You never do in service to God what you think is wrong, what you have doubts about, but you do what you know is right all the time. That's what we should do. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. My conscience does not bother me. I make sure I'm doing what I know is right the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Well, how can you have a good conscience in all that you do? Well, first of all, you got to educate your conscience, don't you? That's the reason you need to come on Wednesday night, and you need to come on Sunday morning, and you need to have all the Bible classes and study your Bible daily on your own, so you know what you're doing is right, and you can have a clean conscience about the things you do. Do it with a fervent spirit, not like, like a sluggard, Oh, we got to go to church. Oh, I got to do this or that. But with some zeal behind what you do is what kind of service the Lord wants. In Romans 12 and verse 11, not lagging behind in diligence. You're industrious. You're, you're wanting to do the work and promote the cause. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do it with humility, knowing that our service, all of us, we fall short. That there's not any of us are the perfect servant of God. I'm certainly not, and I haven't met many people that would profess that they don't have sin and they don't make mistakes and fall short of the standard of the Lord's service. But we serve with humility, and we serve with our heart, and we serve no matter what the trials may be. Listen to Paul. He's talking to a group of elders of the church and trying to tell them how they ought to serve the church. He says, serve the Lord with all humility. He uses himself as the example, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. So that's the way Paul served the church there at Ephesus. That's now, follow my example. I remained humble in my service. I wasn't looking for praise and for promotion, but I was here to do good for other people. And I shed tears over those that were suffering or that fell away or whatever. And I had many trials I had to go through because of persecution. And you have to be ready for that kind of service to be a servant of God and a good Christian. Serve even if you've got to sacrifice your own life. That's the kind of sacrifice that Jesus made. We started off with that, didn't we? And now it's reflected in how we're going to serve the Lord. Even if I have to die to be faithful to the Lord. I'm going to die. That needs to be our determination. 
You know, anything else short of that you have to sacrifice ought to be easy <laughs> if laying down your life is what you're willing to do. He says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul had been appointed an apostle. He said he was going to see it through. Going to see that through if it he had to lay down his life, he's going to do it. And he was going to take that money that was contributed for the poor saints in Jerusalem. He was going to deliver that money. And brethren were saying, Paul, you'll get arrested if you go there. They'll throw you in jail if you go there. You may be put to death if you go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. Paul said, I don't count my life as dear to myself. I'm going to finish the job. And he took the money and he did get arrested, didn't he? And he did get sent to prison. But he's going to do his duty. He talks about another man when he was in prison, a man named Epaphroditus. He was a member of the church at Philippi. And the Philippians wanted to help Paul in his imprisonment. And they sent Epaphroditus with some money to help Paul. And Paul was, Epaphroditus was going to be Paul's servant there in prison. But when he got there, he got sick. And he almost died. And all the brethren were worried about Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was, you know, concerned about what the brethren back home were thinking. He'd been so sick and all, and he wanted to go home, and uh, Paul wanted him to go home. <laughs> and so he wrote about him and told him how everybody in the church should look up to Epaphroditus because he was willing to serve, and it nearly cost him his life. In Philippians 3.20, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. It says, you need to honor a man like Epaphroditus. He's a model for all of us today to serve the Lord. Paul, when he looked at his life, he'd done all of this service that we see about, and he's an example for us to imitate. And when he got to the end of his life and he's facing death, he said, my death is just going to be the, the drink offering on top of the sacrifice. That's the last thing they would pour on when they were offering a sacrifice. They'd pour the drink offering on top. And Paul said, that's the way my death is going to be viewed. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. He says, if that's the way I got a crown at all, I'm happy to do so. So that you can be saved, you can grow and go to heaven. The Lord knows about our service. That's something that ought to be a, a great encouragement to every one of us. That, uh, you know, you've been toiling and serving the Lord for many years and doing things nobody knows that you do, <laughs> helping people. Whether people recognize that or ever uh, reward you for it or thank you for it or whatever, the Lord knows what service that each one of us do. And he's not going to forget any good deed we, we've done. He'll remember those things. He told us. <clears throat> those seven churches, he would start the letters off to each of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 by pointing out, I know, the Lord knows you, he knows me. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. The Lord said, I know what's going on in the church and in your life. And he's going to reward us. Just think about all of those humble servants and slaves that were members of the church back there in the first century. And they were serving the Lord with cheerfulness even though they had masters that were cruel or mean to them or whatever. The Lord didn't forget any of that. He's going to pay them back and He was going to pay them back more than they ever sacrificed for Him. It says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And the Lord's going to pay you back with an eternal weight of glory. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 37, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to serve us someday. That's going to be the reward. And what service can He give? Raise us from the dead. Give us a glorified body. Give us eternal life in the kingdom of God and all the provisions that we need there. All of that is laid up for us. Blessed are those whose slaves are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve 
and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. What a picture. You think about a, a, a master's been away for a long time and he comes back home and here he's got his faithful servants doing their duty when he shows up. And what's the, what's the master do? He, he puts an apron on and he serves the servants. I don't know if in literal life that ever happened, but that's what it's pictured that the Lord's going to do. If here we've lived this life of service, he's going to serve us. What, a, what an idea. And uh, what a day that's going to be. Serving us beyond the grave in the life to come. Those that came out of the great tribulation, they served the Lord and they loved not their life even unto death. And the Romans put them to death in different cities. And what happened to them when their spirit was taken by the angels to paradise? What happens to those, those Christians? It says, for this reason they are before the throne of God. And they serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne shall spread His tabernacle over them. So someday we're going to get to transfer our service from here in this life to serving in the Lord's temple in heaven. I don't know what all is involved in that service. But we're going to have jobs to do. Satisfying service to give beyond this world. We're just practicing down here for what greater things are yet to come. In, or you think beyond the resurrection now. There's going to be service there. In Revelation 22, 3, And there shall no longer be any curse. And the, throne of, uh, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And His bondservants shall serve Him. So, you know, we often have pictures, you know, the bunch of clouds and people are floating on the clouds with their harps. And um, <laughs> it sounds like we got more to do than that when we get to heaven, doesn't it? Sounds like it's going to be some wonderful jobs we're going to have to do. I don't know. The Lord hadn't revealed the details. But we're serving in here to get ready for some eternal service someday. It's going to be so perfect and satisfying uh, that we can do that job. Well, brethren, I hope that these things are an encouragement to all of us because I know without a doubt this sermon has application for you because it has application for everybody. We're here to serve. Serve God. Serve one another. And get ready for that service above. You know, if you're not right with the Lord this morning, and you're not uh, able to serve the Lord in newness of spirit because you've been forgiven of your sins and made a citizen in the kingdom of God, it's just a step away for you to leave the world and to come to Christ. We're going to sing a song. It's only a step. It's only a step. I can remember back when I was wanting to obey the gospel. I'd hear a sermon, and I wanted to step out in the aisle, and, and I was kind of afraid to you know, make that commitment at the time and didn't. And uh, later on, when I obeyed the gospel, it was such an easy thing to say, you know, yeah, I want to serve the Lord. It's just an easy step. You just got to take it you got to make up your mind and be decisive, and I'm going to do it. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you'll never regret it if you do so. It's the greatest blessing of all to be able to be put into service for the Lord and to be forgiven of your sins. Jesus said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieves shall be condemned. If you need to obey the gospel today, we want to encourage you to do so. If you've not been faithful in your service, won't you repent? and pray the Lord's forgiveness and get back to work. If you need the prayers of the church, you need to, uh, our help in any way, won't you let us know as together we stand and